So we will start with Irina Palau. Okay, good morning everyone and thank you very much to the organizers for allowing me to share some thoughts about what the next generation VLA will do in, in related to astrochemistry in star forming regions. So yesterday we, we saw this session of star formation and uh, we saw that star formation takes place is well described in several stages. Ideally, we would like to um, understand the chemistry in the protoplanetary disk stage at disk scales and to follow this chemistry down to the um, planet forming uh, regions. So from the disk scale to the planetary systems. But we have a big problem, and is that the chemical models are not well tuned, are not well constrained to follow the chemistry all the way from the disk scales down to the planet forming scales. So we need to move a few steps earlier and constrain the chemical models in the stages where chemistry is most well detected, which are the class zero and first stages of low mass uh, objects. These stages are sometimes found with associated with a very rich chemistry, chemistry, not only in the low mass case, where we call them hot corinos, but also in the, hot, in the high mass case, where we call them uh, hot cores. So uh, the very first thing is to understand this, the chemistry in this stage. And one thing to do is try to understand why not all the protostars in the class zero first stage or the high mass objects previous to the ultra compact to region stage, why not all of them present such a rich chemistry. And for this, um, my PhD student, Esmeralda Trayet, is using Alma Vega to uh, observe one region in Orion. It's, Ori it's called Orion South. And this was observed with, by Luis Tapata with the uh, submillimeter array a few years ago. And the region looks like this. With ALMA, we observe this region and it looks like this. It's uh, 20 uh, times more sens sensitive. So, and, more, and we have more resolution. So that's how this cluster looks like. So in the, in the observations of Luis Zapata and Tere Orozco, uh, they detected two hot corinos in this cluster forming region. So the question is, with our higher sensitivity with ALMA, are we detecting more hot corinos? Are we increasing the detection rate? And the answer is yes. This, the central panel is uh, the moment zero of methyl formate. And as you can see, there are many sources detected here, in addition to the two hot cores previously detected by the SMA. And all of these uh, sources seen in methyl formate are actually rich in many complex organic molecules. So this is, in addition, consistent with previous works, very recent works that have mm, made blind searches of complex organic molecules in protostars. And they also find uh, detection rates of between 60% and from 20 to 60%. These are in Perseus and Orion. So um, the, the, the lesson from this is that increasing sensitivity is crucial to really detect and to really understand the chemistry in the class zero first uh, low mass protostars and also in the high mass protostars. Because thanks to this, we could move from a detection rate of 14% with the SMA in Orion South to 43% in Orion South with ALMA. So improving a factor of about 20 in sensitivity, which was this factor between these two observations, improved the detection rate by a factor of three. So with the next generation VLA, the improvement in sensitivity is a factor of 
100. So we will really be able to detect all the, uh, all the host corinos that are present in those regions. But note that uh, these surveys have been done in nearby star forming regions. They are done in Perseus and Orion, essentially. So, and in addition, they are done, all of them, at one millimeter. So these detection rates that we have so far are low, are low uh, limits. Why? Because we, at one millimeter, we all know that we have dust opacity effects. So this was quite evident in our data also. I'm showing here three examples of the cluster of Orion South, where the color scale is the one millimeter continuum emission and the black contours correspond to methyl cyanide. So as you can see in these three examples, we have a clear shift, a clear offset between both. And we consider that maybe this could be due to dust opacity effects. If this is the case, if we move to three millimeter, where we found archival data of ALMA, then we shouldn't find this shift, or at least it should be smaller, right? So using this archive data for the three same uh, sources, now the color scale is methyl cyanide and the black contours are the millimeter continuum. So at three millimeter, we don't have such an offset. And this is consistent with the fact that the dust opacity at one millimeter is really maybe preventing us from detecting hot corinos. So with the, in this sense, the next generation VLA will be really perfect. This is consistent with the work, with the work of Marta de Simon uh, uh, that was published earlier. And okay, we will be able to detect uh, many, many hot corinos. We hope that all the present hot corinos in, the, in these nearby regions, and we hope also to detect uh, hot corinos much farther away with the next generation BLA. But not only the sensitivity is allowing us to make proper census of how many hot corinos we have in the star forming regions, it will also allow us to enlarge our molecular inventory. As this was shown by, uh, uh, I will show you in, in a few slides, just mentioning that these more complex molecules, which are called uh, prebiotic molecules, are intrinsically faint, and in ALMA bands, they are completely within the confusion limit. So we cannot detect them because we detect so many lines. This is an example. We detect so, so many lines in, for example, the ALMA bands, three millimeter or one millimeter, that we cannot really, we don't have room for more fainter lines, such as the prebiotic molecules. So this is an example of how, with 10 hours of the next generation VLA, we will be able to detect actually amino acids that are currently undetected. So the second crucial contribution of the next generation VLA to astrochemistry will be the resolution. Because in the classical first stage of low mass star formation and high mass star formation, we have many components. We have the envelope in the colder parts outside, in the inner parts more close to the bees. We have accretion streamers. We have uh, the outflows creating cavities. We have many processes. And we need to resolve them to really tune the, the, the chemical models. Because in each of these components might be dominating a different process. So uh, the different components that we would like to disentangle with this huge improvement in resolution are the disk, outflow cavity and shocks, and accretion streamers. So I just show here a compilation of the uh, works in the literature that I have found that report complex organic molecules in disks. These are actually are very few. For example, the first one was reported by Karin Oberg in 2015. She detected uh, methyl cyanide I, in, this, in this object, but as you can see, the detections are really, really at the limit of sensitivity. And 
there was also the detection of methanol and, and more recent works even detected uh, dimethyl ether and methyl formate and formamide but and sorry another source a judge 212 was also detected in formamide but as far as i know please tell me if you know more works but in 10 years or more that alma has been operating we only have three disks detected in complex organic molecules quite complex such as dimethyl ether and so on so this is a very low detection of complex organic molecules in disks and there are suggestions made by nafari and, and other people that dust opacity might actually also have a role so we need this uh, alma this next generation vla observations what about the outflow cavity uh, for this, I would like to go to the, uh, this, go back to Orion South. In one of the hot corinos that we detected in Orion South, there were uh, a region for which the, the one protostar with this outflow for which the complex organic molecules are quite extended. This is a summary of, of the moment zero of different complex organic molecules. So we have a clear extension here. And we considered whether it could be an accretion streamer. We applied a, a simple model by Alejandro Lopez that it's consistent with an accretion streamer, but it could also be an outflow cavity wall, right? So first, I did uh, next generation VLA simulations of first, whether it could actually detect uh, extended structures like streamers around protostars. To do this, I used the the Patrick Hennebel and Benoit Comaxon simulations. I focused on this panel and well, first I did many attempts to finally get the simulations, <laughs> but once I was convinced, first Alma would see it like this. The simulation with Alma would look like this in, in the most extended configuration and with the next generation VLA, it would look like this. So it's really a very big difference and I tested different uh, subarrays and combinations, even with only the mean array, we would see those structures like streamers accreting onto the protostars. I also run simulations of outflow cavity walls, and these were taken from, from Drogdoskaya in 2015. She modeled the cavity wall, and I selected these uh, panels for dimethyl ether and methyl formate that we have detected with ALMA. And these are the models. And this is how ALMA would see it. And this is how the next generation VLA would see it. I'm impressed. It's really impressive how the imaging improves with the next generation VLA. So we could be able to distinguish between uh, the different properties in the cavity walls for each molecule. This is dimethyl ether is more, is more seen in the, in the walls, while methyl formate is better seen in the, in the in closer to the disk. So just to finish, a very, the, the case of a very low mass object. This object is a protobrander. It's, it has a, an outflow. It has a kind of uh, disk-like structure with a velocity gradient and its dynamical mass is 13 Jupiter masses. So the nice thing, well, this, in addition, this object, which is like a class zero brander, has a thermal radio jet, and, but it's detected uh, very, uh, barely detected with a VLA. So with the next generation VLA, we would detect this thing at 90 sigma, excellent, the thermal radio jet, and we would detect this kind of thermal radio jets associated with a very low mass objects down up to three kiloparsec, which is really great. And to finish, this object has complex organic molecules associated. It's a 13 Jupiter mass class zero object. It's in the border between a planet and a, and a brander. So as you can see here with ALMA, there's methyl formate associated with this 
um, position of the protostar, but it's really, really at the limit. With the next generation BLA, we would be able to detect this with a signal to noise ratio of 20 and with many lines of methyl formate. So we also expect to have an important contribution of the next generation BLA in the very low mass regime as well. So I stop here. <laughs> I spent a lot of time. <laughs> uh, no, I took the simulation. I already had the simulation in intensity. I, they get the Patrick Henneman and Bernard Comerson sent me the column density. I converted to intensity. And then um, I just assumed the different course of the, the different subarrays of the next generation VLA. But uh, I should tune the intensity better and I should also check well the scale that we are observing. I was just making uh, some tries to, some attempts to see if the next generation would, would follow these uh, streamers. So, so you have to make that the column density proportional to the intensity. Yes. <laughs> okay, so let's continue with the event. Thank you, Anna. Yes. <laughs> Hello. Uh, hello. Yes. Okay. We're ready. Eh, cuando mandé mi título, era un título muy general antes de revisar todo el programa y luego decidí mejor enfocarlo a los planetas transitantes ya después de que vi todas las pláticas que iba a haber. Entonces, les voy a hablar un poco de lo que podemos ver con los planetas transitantes y, y lo que me imagino que podemos hacer con el NGBLA, porque no soy una radioastrónoma. Entonces, la charla la voy a dar en inglés para aquellas personas que, que no hablan español. So, the exoplanet field is relatively new, and importantly, it has been observationally driven. This means that throughout, since 1995 or 1992, when the first extrasolar planetary system was identified. Um, we have gone from that knowing our solar system as a prototype for a planetary system to ha from having two, in 19 <laughs> two planetary systems in 1992 to having to yesterday 5,504 known exoplanets. Uh, importantly, the exoplanetary systems that are known are very different from our solar system. And this is where the observationally driven part comes in and why I think the NGVLA can provide important um, uh, ways to look into planetary system based on the exoplanet population. The first example of what I mean is what the, the first extrasolar planet found around the main sequence star was 51 Peg B. And it was a hot Jupiter. This opened a new type of planets that we don't have in our solar system and we, don't, we didn't expect them to form so close to their star or to be so close to their star. Actually, we don't expect them to form so close to the star. But this meant that once we found that exoplanets, we, had, we needed a theory of how solar systems are formed or planetary systems are formed to be able to explain how the hot Jupiter got there. This introduced um, the need for migration, so the planets form outside in the, in the disk where the material is available, and then have to come close to the star. So I, I hope you leave this talk with. Uh, observations are really important in the exoplanet field for us to understand how planetary systems are formed. So I'm gonna talk about transiting planets. Most of you already know what they are. This means that the way that the orbit is inclined with respect to us, the observers, uh, the plane crosses the disk of the star. We identify them from their light curve, which is just the light of the star as a function of time. 
And when the planet is eclipsing the star, then we see uh, a decrease in flux. The decrease in flux is, gives us a measure, a direct measure of the planet's radius. From this, once we know the radius of the star, then we can derive the radius of the planet. This is important because then we don't need to assume a radius. We, can actually, we actually know what the size of the planets are. So most of the, the exoplanets that are known out of the 5,500, uh, about 3,800 exoplanets are transiting. This has been the most successful technique to, to identify um, extrasolar planets, and it's mainly driven by the Kepler data releases, um, K2 and now TESS. So those are satellites, just because the likers that we can get are more precise than what we can get from the ground. So how do these planetary systems form? I'm really thankful to Aina for the lovely introduction of what comes in the disk. So I, you, we already, between yesterday and today, have a better idea of what it is. We have the molecular clouds. I'm gonna go super fast. Um, where you form the protostars, and eventually you end up with disks with dust and gas. And this is where the, the, ex, the planets are formed. We care about what is the material that is in the disk because those are going to be the building blocks of the planetary system. So there is a close connection between the chemical structures and processes that happen in the disk and the outcomes of planet formation. Okay, this is like the, the, main, the main thing you should leave besides observationally driven. For example, uh, at snow lines of different volatiles, planet formation will be more or will be less efficient given uh, the grain coagulation rates for the given material. So an example of what I mean uh, or what can be done with the exoplanet um, populations and comparing them to this is this paper by Fernandez et al, 2019 where they show the observed RV giant planets. These are radial velocity planets that have been, either, that have been detected via radial velocities, which is in the green. Um, and what they say is that there is a pileup around 2 AU. When they compare them to different um, synthesis population, population synthesis models, in this case, the burn model, they, and these models include core accretion and migration, they say that this, this bump, they can be reproduced close to the water snow, well, snow line, not like, <laughs> but the water snow line. So in, in this paper, they, they present this idea that I, the pileup could be due to the existence or being close to the snow line. Um, another thing to consider is that uh, in this paper by Oberg in 2011, and I know it's old, but it's still, you know, very cited in terms of the disk composition, uh, and specifically in the CO ratio, what they have is how the CO ratio of the gas in the, in the uh, continuous line and the grains in the dashed line uh, changes as you go uh, further away from the star. So the idea in this, in this model that they, ha that they presented here is that because the planets are being born in the disk, when they accrete their gaseous envelope, then they should have, um, there should be evidence depending on where, where they accreted that envelope, okay? So going back to this, Okay, we will have uh, like fingerprints of where they are formed, of the, where the planets are formed in the disk in the atmosphere because the composition or the CO ratio in this case uh, by the Oberg model would, will change as we go far away from the star. So going back to the exoplanets and specifically the transiting planets, when the star is crossing the disk, we can have transmission spectra of the atmosphere. This is basically shown in this um, little schematic where the planet is no longer 
an opaque disk, but now it, it has a small atmosphere. Well, it's not so small for us to see it, but you know what I mean. Uh, so what is happening in the transmission spectra, as the, turn, as the planet is going in front of the star, then the light of the star will cross through the atmosphere, and we will see imprints of the atmosphere in the, in the, in the planet transit. This means that because, depending on the composition of the atmosphere, then the radius, the, the radius of the planet that we measure will be different at different wavelengths, and that is the transmission spectrum. Here I'm going to show you a little gif of what I mean. Obviously, it's the same planet, so the radius should be the same, but at different wavelengths, then the atmosphere will be more or less opaque. For example, in, in the uh, 2.1 micron, in this simulation or in this little GIF, it is much more opaque. So then, I mean, uh, in the, it's more opaque in the 2.3, sorry. So then it seems like the radius is bigger. And this, has to, this gives us information of what the composition of the planet is. For this, um, JWST has been revolutionary in what we know of the planet atmospheres, and we will continue to see more results in the next, you know, few years. Not even. It's coming out now. This, this, these results are coming out now. Um, over 30% or here, 31.6% of cycle two uh, time for JWST was uh, assigned for the exoplanets and exoplanet formation. This also includes some disks. But there are, um, I didn't count them, I tried, and then I, but a, a large percentage of, the, of that time is actually to do exoplanet atmospheres. So then I want to show you an example, um, and this is the ERS, Near Spec Prism uh, Transit Spectroscopy or Transmission Spectroscopy of Saturn mass planet WAS-39. This was published in 2022. And what we see here is the white light transit light curve. And what we have here, this is time, and this is the relative flux. This is summing up all the light at all wavelengths. And here what we have is um, the, the, different, the, the light at different wavelengths of their spectra. When we do bins in wavelengths, then we can get at each, at, at each bin, for example, here, I cannot, I cannot see exactly what they are. Uh, anyway, you will have to believe me or go look at the paper to know exactly what size bin they are. But when you do a tiny bin in wavelength and you sum up that light, then you get the transit at different wavelengths. And this is what we have here. So basically we're transforming this plot into transit light curves. Two minutes, oh my goodness, okay. I think we still have time. So what do we have here? We have the transit depth. Now, now we know from each of those light curves, we could measure the size of the planet at that light curve. So each of the dark, the black points are a measurement uh, from those spectra. And what we have here is the model of what is the composition of, of that atmosphere. And we have the different contributions, for, for example, the sodium line right here. We have um, CO2 here. We have uh, water over here. So then we can see now in the atmosphere contributions of different molecules, which we can then try to do the inventory, not of the disk, but of what is in the planet atmosphere. Um, we can now estimate based on this, uh, the, the CO ratio that is in the atmosphere. Uh, okay, so, so what do we need to do with NGVLA? <laughs> NGVLA will allow us to do a better, as Aina, already spoke about, do a better inventory of what is, not only of what are the organic or prebiotic molecules, complex molecules, but really to do the inventory of what is the carbon and oxygen um, inventory in, available in the disk. And with other exoplanet atmospheres, we can then look at what the atmospheres are look like and trying to do 
but we need many disks, not only three disks for, for with the ones that we can measure these things. And we need many exoplanet atmospheres. So we can then start to make this link between where the planets are formed, what their atmospheres look like, and what the disks um, uh, hold. <laughs> I think this is it. Oh, perfect time. <laughs> There's a question over there in the back. Hello, uh, a different presentation. And my question is about the plot where you were showing the physical composition of the atmosphere. What is the meaning of the clouds there? Uh, what? Show a, a region of clouds with the name of clouds. So when we have clouds, yeah, thank you, <laughs> this one here. So when we have clouds, then the atmosphere is opaque regardless of what it is uh, made of, and we cannot see through. The transmission is not going to go through the clouds. So this prevents us from going uh, deeper into the atmosphere, for example, but also some of the some of the features are, are not as significant because of clouds. So if you have a, a very opaque cloud deck, then it's going to prevent us from look, like seeing what the atmosphere is, is like or what its composition is. So uh, it's easier because in general the inflated radius will be or be, they are larger than what would be expected for hydrogen only planets. Um, as we need like a large scale height of the atmosphere to be able to actually see the, the effect on the transmission spectrum. So if it's a very compact uh, atmosphere, uh, like for example, a super Earth or a warrel world, then the transmission signature will be much smaller. So the inflated radius, so the giant planets are the ones that we can actually measure a lot of things for. Hello, can you hear me? <clears throat> this is working? Ah, because this is uh, for... Uh, hello? La de Keynote. La de Keynote, por favor. ¿No la tienes? ¿No la tienes? Puedo bailar. No, no, no sé, güey, no sé hablar sin eso.
Okay, so I'm going to talk about the plan formation, and we are waiting for the planet to be formed. So maybe you don't know this image. Okay, thank you. So this is a story about the, uh, how planets are formed, and we, we, we really don't know. But uh, I'm going to talk about uh, what we could really know about the uh, dust evolution, because dust will give uh, rise to planets. So we know that protoplanetary disks uh, are around protostars, and they are made of gas and dust. 90% of gas, we think, at least at the formation time, and 10% of dust. Uh, most of the gas is accreted to the protostar, and what we think is that the dust remaining in the disk will give rise to uh, terrestrial planets and the core of uh, giant uh, gaseous uh, planets. How this is gonna, uh, how planets are gonna be formed, we still don't know. Uh, what we think is uh, that the dust should gradually grow to form uh, the planets and planetesimals and uh, the, the core of the uh, uh, giant planet. So we have, at the beginning, at the formation of the disk, we, we have uh, dust with, uh, uh, with the size of microns. These, for some uh, physical mechanism, should form uh, rocks of uh, one millimeter or one centimeter, and this should form something with kilometers, which is called uh, planetesimals, and then planetesimals are gonna give, uh, uh, I'm gonna build uh, terrestrial planets, the course. And this is very, uh, very difficult to explain, actually. This is a good idea, but this is very difficult to explain. And there are several theoretical problems. The main problem is that the dust is not uh, um, uh, quiet in the disk, it's moving, it's evolving. And for example, the uh, smallest particles in the disk are uh, coupled to the gas, but the larger grains. Uh, are affected by draft forces by the, by the gas, because the gas is what uh, uh, dominates the, the, the kinematics in the disk. So what happens when we have uh, large particles is that they settle in the mid-plane. We have an atmosphere of small uh, particles, uh, but in most of the large particles are uh, settled in the mid-plane, and then we, they move, they move to the center. This is called the migration, and eventually they will be lost uh, uh, they, they, they will go to the protostar, and we lost them to form planets. So this is a big problem. This is, uh, uh, here you can see in radius of the disk, and this is the grain size, and this is the maximum grain size you can have because of the drift barrier, because of this migration to the center, and the fragmentation barrier, because when you start to have very large particles and they collide, they don't uh, uh, stick together. The fragment. So, from these studies, what you what you see here is that it is very difficult theoretically to explain particles bigger than one meter size. So, how do we form uh, these planets? So, the obvious thing is uh, we can uh, measure uh, 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 the size of the dust in several days. And um, luckily, uh, dust thermal emission is very uh, bright in the uh, millimeter. Uh, in, in the millimeter wavelength. This is a typical uh, SED of a protoplanetary disk. And as you can see, this is the optically thick part in the well in the submillimeter. The maximum, the peak of the emission is uh, around uh, the, the submillimeter. It depends on the, on, the, on the physical characteristic. But here, in the millimeter and the centimeter, we have bright and uh, uh, optically thin emission. Transparency of the dust uh, increases with the wavelength. 
Okay, so this is this is very nice because uh, we also need very high angular resolution, but we can build millimeter uh, interferometers and we can reach uh, right now uh, 10 milliard seconds of resolution, which is very very good because we have a, a resolution physical resolution of one AU. Uh, so interferometers are a, a, a good uh, um, instrument to observe protoplanetary disks and the dust evolution. Okay, so how is the evolution of protoplanetary disk observations? How how we can we have been able to observe these guys and uh, study them? We started in the 90s, and uh, Luis Felipe Rodriguez was actually a pioneer in the observation of protoplanetary disk with the BLA, which was not built as a millimeter uh, interferometer, was built as a centimeter uh, um, interferometer. But uh, we realized that we can observe this, and these are three disks with three different ages. And these are BLA images, One, uh, some of the earliest resolved uh, images of uh, protoplanetary disk. And they don't look very, very exciting, but we were very excited at that uh, time. This is what we were doing in the 2000s. This is another interferometer, gamma, one millimeter, one of the, uh, th th that was a big step in the millimeter, uh, in millimeter um, observations. The VLA, the, the updated VLA with more sensitivity was able to do, th these are the same disks, okay? Uh, th uh, this is with the updated BLA, and this is with the SMA at one millimeter. So this, now we are starting to see substructures and the this, something that looks actually like a this. And this is what we are doing now with ALMA, obviously. And you, ca you can see a lot of details in protoplanetary this. Uh, this was made with ALMA. ALMA is the most powerful uh, millimeter interferometer we have built to the moment. And it has been working for almost 10 years, and we have learned a lot uh, from protoplanetary disks. What we have learned, and this is a very brief summary, and is focused only on the dust evolution, what we have uh, learned. And this is uh, an image uh, every, everybody knows. This is a shell tau. This is a one solar mass uh, protostar here in the center, and it has this, this with 100 a use of uh, radius, and then mm, this is one. This was one of the first images uh, of with, using long baseline with ALMA, and the obvious characteristic here, the most uh, impressive characteristic here, is that we have bright rings and dark rings. This is dust emission, so the dust is not a smooth uh, uh, distributed, it's smooth, it's smoothly distributed in the disk. So the dust is, uh, looks like it is accumulated in uh, uh, several places. We now know that dense dust, uh, that bright rings are related to uh, dense dust, and dark rings are related to gaps. This is uh, another, uh, the second uh, uh, long baseline observation of a protoplanetary disk. This, this is the TWU Adria. These are the, the, the same, this uh, I showed at the beginning. And uh, we found the same substructure, gaps and ring, but these are different. And this is a gap at one uh, astronomical unit. So this uh, could be uh, the formation, we, this could be related to the formation of a terrestrial planet. About uh, 2018, we have observed a lot of this. This is the discharge survey, and we observe uh, a lot of this. They didn't know uh, they, they didn't know any evidence of uh, substructures in this disk, but they, they, they found substructures in almost all of them, rings and gaps. So uh, around 2018, we were thinking all this, all protoplanetary disks has substructures, uh, are, uh, at least are very common. This is another survey, uh, Alma, uh, a survey of uh, Taurus, uh, star forming region, uh, in 2019. And this is, uh, I, I like to show this because uh, you can see here a lot of this with substructures, but they also detected a lot of this with no substructures, and indeed very, very compact. And these are actually the most common bees in star forming regions. So I, I'm gonna go back to, to this uh, later, but it is important that we also focus on the study of these disks, and these are very compact and very small disks. This is a simulation of how the dust moves in the disk, and you can see different, uh, uh, different sizes particles, and 
large particles migrate inwards, uh, the small particles remain coupled with the gas. A gap is going to be here. It's going to be formed here. And then the dust is trapped here. And this is what we call a ring. So this is the reason why uh, uh, substructures are important. They give us a way to stop the migration of the large particles. They are accumulated in the ring. And there, they have a lot of time to grow and to form uh, planetesimals. So this is the most important result from ALMA. Uh, Substructures are common. And th this is a, a, a nice uh, work. Uh, after several uh, years of serving this with ALMA, with, with 700 these in a lot of uh, star forming regions, they, uh, they, they, they plotted this, uh, this, uh, uh, this plot. This is dust. Uh, this is the mass of the dust in the disk. And this is the radius of the disk. And these are separated. The colors are non, uh, in black is non structured disk. This is, these are compact disks with no substructures. And the color ones are disks with substructures. And they are, all of them are uh, large. So the interpretation of this is what I have just uh, said uh, that. Uh, the, when you have substructures, when you have rings and gaps, you can retain the dust more time, and you uh, you have a very large disk. And if not, if you don't have rings or gaps, you uh, concentrate all the gas, and you have a compact disk. So what's the origin of substructures? So this is the easiest way to, to, to explain substructures. Here is an accretion planet. This is a simulation of the gas and dust. And what is going to happen is when you have and accreting protoplanet, you destroy the structure of the disk. And you end with a lot of uh, rings and gaps. OK? So this is the easiest way to form uh, substructures, rings and gaps. But then what happens here? So we need a planet to form rings to form planets, because the best place to grow the dust is in the ring. And we need a planet to form the rings. Oh, don't mean it. So uh, th this is, uh, uh, th there, are, uh, there are several other mechanisms to form uh, 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 rings. And the, the most famous one is with the snow lines. So in the snow lines, uh, uh, nice things uh, happen because the, 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 physical, the physical parameters of the dust change uh, dramatically. So you can have accumulations in the snow line. And I, I was a big supporter of that, but actually the truth is that we cannot explain with the snow lines these structures. Uh, these wide and deep gaps is impossible to explain with snow lines and with uh, uh, slight changes in the composition of the dust grains. We need planets here. And there, are, there is also no correlation between most of the rings and the location of the snow line. So this does not mean that we cannot form rings in the snow line. This means that most of these are due to protoplanets. And we have indeed detected protoplanets. This is a detection of a protoplanet in a wide gap. And this is dust from the circumplanetary uh, this, uh, uh, surrounding this, this planet. So in this same uh, study of 700, uh, um, 700 uh, uh, observations, they propose this, uh, uh, this uh, scenario. And this is what we think is happening now. So th there are two ways of the evolution of the protoplanetary disk. If for some reason the disk is able to form a planet, a very massive planet at the beginning, this is fast formation of a, very, of a very massive planet, so the disk will form rings and gaps, and it will remain uh, a large disk with rings and gaps, and it, it will retain dust uh, in the dense rings. If for some reason there is no fast formation, the disk cannot stop the migration, and it becomes compact, like 10 I use a, a, uh, size. So at the end, eventually, both kind of these will form uh, slowly uh, uh, dust grow, and they will form uh, planets by a difference. So where well, we need a next generation BLA, the reason is dust. Is it, is this? We need longer wavelength in order to observe dust, uh, the more transparent dust, and uh, larger sizes. For the moment, we are using the BLA, 
and this implies we need hundreds of hours to service this. But I'm gonna show uh, some examples. This is what we can do uh, combining uh, observations on multi-wavelength uh, with ALMA and BLA. The BLA, you, uh, you detect the uh, central part of, of, of the disk and the larger particles. And, we, and from this, we can have the physical uh, uh, parameters of the disk uh, radially, and we can uh, we can see where, where, where is a planet or uh, ch changes in the size and the density related to uh, the uh, snow lines. And these are millimeter sized particles. This is uh, uh, a constraint. And uh, rings appear uh, pretty uh, symmetric in ALMA images. And this is because they are optically thick. When we move to optically thinner emission, we can see substructures within the rings. And we think that these are the earliest stages of protoplanets, but actually we need better image fidelity like the NGBLA. This is a nice, compari nice comparison, HL Tau and DG Tau, they are, the, the protostars are the same, are very similar, but the these are very different. This is a large and ring uh, uh, this, and this is a small and compact, but if you look very carefully, you also see substructures, and when you look at the BLA, you are able to detect substructures. So this means that compact this, are uh, uh, very, very uh, optically thick, very dense. And this is what we are doing now because we are comparing uh, the size of the disk. We cannot do this in a lot of disks because it's, it's very expensive in observation time, but we can only measure the size of different uh, wavelengths. And with larger, length, with larger wavelengths, we are uh, looking at, this, at the position, at the location, the extension of the larger particles. And what we are uh, finding is that even the compact disk has the same, uh, uh, have uh, large particles in the whole uh, uh, extension of the disk. So I leave you with this, which is the, uh, the list of why we need uh, an NGBLA. Thank you. There is the spiral arms uh, here. So you expect the spiral arms, actually. And uh, so if you look at the simulation, actually what the planet creates is spiral arms. But uh, it accumulates dust in the borders. So this is what we think we, we see like rings. And sometimes we are able to detect the spiral arms. Second, second, second. Most, you say most of the disks that we detect are very compact. Um, so the big, most of them are in Taurus. So I, I, I guess it's not an environmental effect. It's not, it's not because you have total operation from us in the stars. No, but this is Taurus. But the, you see the same in Lupus and other regions. So you, you, you always have some massive disks with substructures and a lot of small disks. And probably with the NGBLA, you are going to uh, find a lot of weaker and smaller uh, 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 disks. Thank you. Um, okay, my, my talk is about the search for exoplanets using radio observations. I hope that at the end of my talk, 
you'll be convinced that we can detect many, many planets using radio observations, especially with the next generation of radio interferometers. And sorry, just uh, I have a problem with my voice. <coughs> okay. <coughs> so, Gillen already mentioned this, but uh, about uh, how many planets we have already found. But something that is uh, very interesting to me is that from these almost 8,000 exoplanets that have been found, only four or five were found using radio observations. So we have a lot to do. And I'll show you some of the examples of the planets that were found using radio observations. So can we detect exoplanets with radio observations? Well, I would say that yes, but it's really, really hard to do it. And one way to, to show you that is if we, say, if we see the solar system, in this case, we know that we can detect all the planets at radio frequencies. And as you can see, here is the flux of the planets uh, normalized a, a, to a distance of one AU. See, just to, be, to compare the, the emission of the different planets. So Jupiter is the strongest one. So Jupiter can be found, can be observed, even with a very short antenna, very small antenna. So we should expect to see Jupiter-like planets in other uh, planetary systems. And Jupiter also is observed in all uh, a very wide range of frequencies, from low frequencies to high frequencies. Where the emission comes from? Well, the low frequencies uh, emission comes from the aurora of the planets, the magnetic poles of the planets. There is, that's the place where the emission is, for, is produced. The, oh, sorry. The synchrotron emission, that is at centimeter wavelengths, is produced in the, a, oh, I'm having the problem. Sorry. So it's produced by the relativistic electrons that are linked to the magnetic field in a thorough way around the planet, around Jupiter. So this, in principle, could also be observed in other exoplanets. And at very high frequencies, the emission is thermal. So this is observed with ALMA and other submillimeter uh, telescopes. So we have telescopes that can observe this. So we know this because we can observe with a low far and low frequencies, belay at centimeter wavelengths. And we can also use high angular resolution observations. So we have several telescopes to, to study these planets in the solar system. But now the question is, can we detect this in other planets, in other so planetary systems? Well, the answer is very, is that it's very difficult to do it. And the reason is like this. If we do the exercise to put Jupiter in a solar, in a planetary system, at one parsec or 10 parsecs away, we wouldn't be able to detect Jupiter at any frequency. It would be so weak, the mission, that we wouldn't be able to detect it. So what we need, what is needed to, to detect the planets? Well, as Gillen mentioned, there is not, we haven't found any solar system, any planetary system similar to the solar system. The planets that we, we have detected are very different to those in the solar system in several ways. For instance, the massive ones, or most of the planets, are very close to the star. And the stars have different ages. So there are different conditions. So we should expect to probably see planets in a different way. So I'll show you a few examples where we already I believe that we already have detected planets using radio observations. This is an example of a very weak source. Probably you don't see it. It's here. It's very, very weak. But it was detected with a BLA in C band. So this is not nothing extraordinary. But however, this source is as it coincides with a a star that is already, already known, observing the optical and the infrared. 
And with those observations, we know that this is a very low mass object. I was going to say a star, but it's not a star. So it, it was found that the age of this object is about six, 600 million years. So using that, the mass of the object is about 23 Jupiter masses. So it's very close to be a planet, or we could say it's a planet. However, later on, it was found that this is object is part of a uh, group of stars that move together and that the age of that group of stars is about 200 million years. So if we correct for that, the mass of this object is about 13 Jupiter masses. So it's just uh, very close to the point of the deuterium uh, 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 burning. So this is probably a planet. Now, a second example, well, Charlie already mentioned about this. Just let me mention that in this case, two possible planets were dete detected, but they were detected at millimeter wavelengths. So this is thermal emission, not synchrotron, not hero-synchrotron, it's thermal emission. So in principle, we will be able to detect these kind of planets. At centimeter wavelengths, we have been observing different kind of stars, young stars and uh, low mass stars. And in this case, this is a T Tauri star. So it's very young. And we were surprised to find two companions. And we de detect one, as you can see here. So one was directly detected. The other one was detected using astrometry. But the surprise that we found is that the mass of these companions is 35 and 44 uh, Jupiter masses. And we know that in this case, the mass is very precise because with the astrometry, we were able to measure the mass of the system and the mass of the star and the mass of the companions. So this could also be planets, well, I would say brown dwarfs, but they are already in the catalog of exoplanets. This is a very strange case. With the LOFAR, this star was detected at very low frequencies. But the surprise was that this star is not young. The magnetic field is very weak, so it shouldn't emit at radio frequencies. So the, the conclusion that the authors uh, obtained was that, well, I would say that is probably the best ex possible explanation using uh, the sp after investigating different cases is that there is a planet orbiting around the star and the magnetic field of the planet interacts with the magnetic field of the star. And so particles from the planet go to the star, they collide in, in the po magnetic poles producing the mission that we observe. So this would be an indirect detection of an exoplanet. And the conclusion that they reached is that this is probably a low mass planet. This, uh, we saw this yesterday. Well, I'll skip this because I think I don't have a lot of time. This is an indirect detection of a planet. This is using astrometry. So we are observing several very low mass stars and we're finding companions of these low mass stars. In this case, the star is uh, just at the limit between boring hydrogen or deuterium. So it could be a brown dwarf or it could be a star. And in this case, we found a companion that has a mass of about 0.4 Jupiter masses. So it's uh, similar to Saturn. See? But this is not the only case. We have detected a few plants this way. So this is a very, very good way to detect planets. So this is what we, we are doing with the telescope that we already have. So with the new telescopes, we should be able to, to do this in, in a much better way. So we could detect weaker companions. We could detect 
weaker signals, astronomical, astrometrical signals, for instance. So we should be able to detect many, many exoplanets. We will be able to detect planets in a very young stage. So inside the protoplanetary disks, we will be able to, to detect young planets associated with uh, solar-like stars, but also very low mass stars. And we will be able to detect them directly, a direct detection, but also an indirect detection. And just let me show you what we can do with the new telescopes. So this is, uh, this is the astrometrical signal that we should expect from a T-Tau star and low mass stars. This is the mass of the planet, this is the period of the orbit, and each of these curves is the uh, astrometric detection, astrometric signal that we expect. In red, sorry, in, in green, is the limit that we have now. So this is what we can do with the BLBA, for instance. And in red is the limit that we will have with the NGBLA. So with the telescope, the BLBA, in the best case, we would be able to detect a very massive star associated to a T-Tauri stars, probably 10, 10 Jupiter masses. But with the NGBLA, we can go down to Jupiter-like and Saturn-like planets. In the case of uh, low mass stars, we're already detecting planets using astrometry. So we can go down to planets with Neptune, Uranus masses, but also Earth-like planets. So we'll be able to detect all these with the NGBLA and the new telescopes. Thank you. Direct detection, we don't have any calculations. So this is something that it was a serendipital detection. So we don't really know how, what we, we should expect to be able to detect. For instance, I didn't mention that, but in the first case, that a planet is not associated to a star. It's a wandering planet. So why it was detected, I don't really know. For the <laughs> indirect detection, using astrometry, well, if you detect the star and with enough precision, sensitivity and astrometrical precision, then you can predict the kind of a signal that you can observe, because basically, the, basically the, the graphs that I showed. So you can do that, but for direct detection, you don't really, we don't really know. Yeah. 
Bueno, buenos días. Primero, me disculpo por mi voz. Estoy un poquito mal, pero bueno, vamos a empezar. Eh, el día de hoy voy a hablar de mi trabajo. Es mi trabajo de maestría. Eh, en este tiempo he estado haciendo un estudio morfológico de una estrella tipo Herbie Gable. Entonces, vamos a ver un poquito de contexto de lo que voy a hablar. Entonces, primero, eh, la formación estelar, como ya sabemos, eh, se genera a partir de una nube de gas y se empieza a colapsar, se generan unas condiciones termodinámicas adecuadas, se, forma, eh, se tiene la formación estelar y alrededor de la estrella se forma un disco eh, de acreción, disco protoplanetario, y después vienen las siguientes fases de evolución estelar. Entonces, ¿cuál es la importancia de estudiar estos discos de, eh, protoplanetarios? pues a lo largo del tiempo se ha podido eh, determinar que estos discos son escenarios perfectos de estudio de la hidrodinámica, de la formación de planetas y de formación de otras estrellas. Entonces hemos tenido estudios con eh, instrumentos en el óptico, en el milimétrico, eh, como por ejemplo ALMA, en donde hemos detectado eh, estructuras bastante complejas y eh, planetas gigantes, al igual que estrellas binarias que apenas se están formando. Entonces, eh, bueno, ¿cuál es mi objeto? Mi objeto es RCRA, eh, es una estrella en la constelación de Corona Australis, es una estrella tipo Herbie Gaby, esto quiere decir que tiene una masa intermedia y es una estrella muy joven, de menos de 10 mega años. Eh, su tipo espectral está en discusión debido a que es un sistema muy complejo y todavía no se ha podido determinar bien cómo es. Se cree hasta ahora que es un sistema triple en donde se tiene una binaria en el, en el núcleo y una componente externa a, muchas más, eh, a una distancia mucho mayor. Se tiene un disco eh, protoplanetario y adicionalmente una presencia de un jet. Entonces, eh, bueno, eh, múltiples autores han podido estudiar a través del infrarrojo la estructura interna de este objeto. Entonces, eh, digamos, por ejemplo, con el instrumento Pioneer en el Bell TI, eh, se ha podido determinar un poco más o menos de cómo va la morfología eh, de, este, de este objeto. Se ve que tiene una, una simetría, como lo vemos acá, y que tiene una variación en más o menos 20 miliarcos segundos. Eh, estos autores, Kluska, en el 2020, ah, logró reconstruir, hacer una reconstrucción de, de la imagen utilizando datos interferométricos en el infrarrojo cercano, en la banda H, y pudo obtener esta imagen en donde podemos ver más o menos y hacernos una idea de cómo es la estructura del objeto. Entonces, en otros estudios, por ejemplo, con Amber, con Sphere, eh, han podido demostrar que se tiene una componente binaria en el centro, es decir, en, en el centro del disco circunestelar, y una componente externa que es una enana marrón. Las eh, binarias internas son de masas muy similares y al parecer se encuentran muy, muy cercanas. Y eh, la componente externa, pues sí, ya está a más o menos unos eh, 0.3 arcos segundos. Entonces, es bastante lejos. Se, tiene, se ha detectado la presencia de un jet eh, por medio de estas observaciones con Sphere. Y eh, otros estudios también con Sphere, junto con Symphony y con Feroz, todos los instrumentos del BLTI, eh, se ha podido determinar cómo es la estructura a gran escala de este objeto. Entonces, eh, se ha dicho que se tiene eh, una región en donde tenemos el jet que tiene una precesión de aproximadamente 66 días. Estos 66 días son acordes al periodo de la binaria interna, como se ha podido determinar eh, con algunos estudios de, de las curvas de luz. Entonces, eh, este jet eh, precisa con, la misma, con el mismo periodo que, que se ha podido detectar de la binaria y adicional se tiene una cavidad eh, en donde el jet digamos que se ve reflejado y eh, el disco más externo. Esta variabilidad eh, se ha detectado a lo largo de diferentes épocas y con diferentes eh, estudios de, de interferometría. 
Entonces, eh, nosotros para este estudio eh, usamos el VLTI, que básicamente es un interferómetro que puede utilizar hasta cuatro telescopios y eh, en, su, digamos, en sus configuraciones hay uno de los, de los instrumentos que es Gravity. Gravity eh, trabaja en la banda K en una longitud de onda central de 2.2 micras y eh, alcanza una resolución espacial de, de hasta 2.000 de arcos segundos. Entonces, esto nos sirve muchísimo para poder eh, estudiar la región interna de, del disco, es decir, lo que está más cerca, digamos, a la fuente central, en donde se generan fenómenos como transferencia radiativa y todo esto. Entonces, para nuestro caso, eh, usamos una configuración corta, en donde tenemos el máximo de línea de base de 35 metros, y por lo tanto alcanzamos una resolución de aproximadamente 6 mil arcos segundos. Eh, teniendo en cuenta que esta, esta estructura o, o la binaria, como tal todo el objeto, tiene un periodo de variabilidad de 66 días, como se ha podido determinar, eh, podemos realizar un, digamos, como un muestreo en donde las fechas pueden considerarse como una de las fases a lo largo del periodo. Entonces, si eh, consideramos el 2023 eh, como una fase cero, vemos que nuestras, cuatro, nuestras otras tres fechas corresponden a una cierta fase a lo largo de este ciclo. Esto siempre y cuando considerando que se tiene eh, una binaria de órbita circular, no se tiene nada de excentricidad y pues son como condiciones óptimas. Pero básicamente podemos hacer como este muestreo de, de las fases. Entonces, para poder estudiar esta variabilidad a lo largo de los 66 días, digamos que cómo cambia, si cambia eh, el disco o el tamaño o lo que queremos estudiar, eh, lo que hicimos fue un ajuste eh, usando un modelo paramétrico a nuestros observables. Tenemos como observables las visibilidades del cuadrado y las clausuras de fase. Pero en este caso, eh, para poder estudiar la fuente extensa, lo único que hacemos es ajustar el modelo geométrico a las visibilidades al cuadrado. Eh, entonces, para poder realizar esto, utilizamos digamos que uno de, un modelo paramétrico eh, usando una gaussiana y eh, una fuente, un, un flujo sobre resuelto. Con estos dos componentes eh, en, podemos aplicarlo en el plano de Fourier para poder eh, hacer nuestro modelo y poder obtener nuestros parámetros eh, que, digamos que inicialmente eh, queremos obtener. Y estos son el, el ángulo de posición del objeto que va en una dirección norte-este, eh, la inclinación digamos, de la gaussiana extendida, eh, el tamaño, como varía tanto en semieje mayor como en semieje eh, menor, y eh, el flujo de nuestra fuente. Entonces, eh, tenemos los resultados. Eh, es evidente que tenemos un cambio de inclinación a lo largo de las diferentes épocas. Tenemos un cambio bastante notable en miliarcos segundos, también en las diferentes épocas, y también eh, un pequeño cambio en el ángulo de posición. Este cambio de tamaño es consistente con el cambio de fase, es decir, cuando estamos en una fase, digamos, como muy cercana a cero, tenemos un tamaño eh, bastante grande y pues así, digamos que se tiene esa variabilidad y es bastante evidente. Entonces, ¿cómo nos aseguramos nosotros para pues, que, que de verdad este, este modelo está buen, pues bien? Eh, hicimos un ajuste, pues el ajuste, eh, digamos acá el, el, los datos azules son nuestros datos, los datos reales y eh, los naranjas son el modelo ajustado. Vemos que el modelo sigue el trend y que digamos que lo describe bastante bien. Eh, el error de esto es muy pequeño, nuestro chi cuadrado es de casi la unidad y eh, el error pues no se alcanza a ver acá porque es de como 0.05. Entonces, eh, aquí vemos que son las visibilidades al cuadrado versus eh, nuestras, frecuen nuestras eh, frecuencias espaciales. Entonces, eh, digamos que nuestro modelo ajusta bien y de verdad nos está mostrando que existe una variabilidad. Entonces, para, Ay. para ver mejor esto, eh, podemos ver en este GIF, digamos de manera gráfica, eh, ¿Cómo se ve la variabilidad real a lo, a lo largo de las cuatro fechas, a lo largo de estas cuatro épocas? 
Y si consideramos pues, que esa variabilidad debería ser consistente con el periodo de la binaria, que son los 66 días, podemos ajustar eh, una función sinusoidal, una función cíclica, a estos datos a ver qué tal. Y pues realmente nos da bastante bien con un root mean square muy, muy, muy pequeño. Entonces, sí estamos viendo una variabilidad con cierta periodicidad de, de, la, de la fuente. Eh, a pesar de que nuestro modelo geométrico es muy bueno, eh, pues es muy básico y muy sencillo, por lo cual necesitamos hacer una reconstrucción eh, de, de las imágenes de los datos para poder estudiar eh, la simetría de esta fuente. Entonces, como solamente con el lago Siena estudiamos como la fuente extensa, pues vamos a, a también estudiar un poco más de, de, la, de la fuente no extendida, sino más compacta, y eh, ver cómo más o menos también se comporta y cómo es eh, la variabilidad. Para esto hicimos una reconstrucción eh, utilizando un método híbrido, que eh, es un método de, regul de minimización regularizada denominado Squeeze, y adicional, eh, utilizamos un modelo paramétrico para eliminar la fuente central, es decir, que la estrellita eh, que no se logra resolver, porque en efecto la binaria no se logra resolver, solamente tenemos especulaciones de que sí existe una binaria en el centro. Entonces, lo que hacemos es quitar la fuente central, la emisión de la fuente central, para poder hacer eh, el ajuste de, de la simetría de, de, del objeto alrededor. Entonces, con este método híbrido que eh, combina la regularización, la minimización regularizada y el, la, sí, la re, re, remoción de la, de la fuente central, podemos hacer una reconstrucción de imágenes a lo largo de las cuatro épocas, en donde vemos que en efecto se tiene una variabilidad, tanto de tamaño, o sea, más o menos eh, se alcanza a, vari, a, vari, a variar unos 2000 arcos segundos, y adicional también de, de la morfología. Vemos que en algunos lados eh, los picos de brillos están como más hacia acá y en, otros, eh, en otras épocas se tienen que los brillos, digamos que los picos de brillo están un poco más eh, separados. Entonces, en efecto, sí se tiene una variabilidad ya más comprobada. Pero entonces, ¿cuál es nuestro escenario? O sea, ¿qué es lo que nosotros pensamos que está sucediendo? Tenemos dos opciones. La primera es que eh, lo que estamos observando con los, con los modelos eh, de estas gaussianas, en donde se ve que la gaussiana eh, elongada cambia de tamaño, puede tener que ver con la variabilidad del jet. Es decir, a escalas muy internas, que es donde nosotros observamos con gravity, podemos en, empezar o podemos alcanzar a detectar el movimiento eh, del jet, esa precesión que tiene el jet y la influencia en la cavidad, que es acorde con lo que pues, otros autores habían estudiado como Rigliaco en el 2019. Y nuestro segundo escenario es que eh, tenemos un disco roto eh, y tenemos, digamos, que material del plano del disco que se está desprendiendo y está saliendo con cierta variabilidad. Esto todavía no, no lo sabemos y no lo tenemos muy claro, pero eh, queremos estudiar un poco más. Y adicional puede tener que ver con una desal... un... que no esté alineado el disco interno de la binaria junto con el disco externo de donde se encuentra la otra componente. Esto puede generar múltiples efectos en, en el disco, como por ejemplo eh, que este... Eh, bueno, como enroscado eh, o roto. Entonces, digamos que estos son nuestros dos escenarios para poder describir lo que estamos haciendo. Y como conclusiones, entonces tenemos en efecto una variabilidad, un cambio de tamaño y un cambio de la inclinación. Este cambio es consistente con el periodo de, 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 de la binaria interna de 66 días, y pues por ende con, con la precesión del jet que pues está influ influenciado por esta binaria. Eh, adicional, eh, los cambios más significativos se tienen en la, en la dirección norte, como veíamos en el GIF. Esto puede tener que ver con la relación que se tiene con el jet, digamos con, el, con la precesión del jet y la influencia en la cavidad. Y adicional, eh, nosotros para eh, el digamos, trabajo futuro o lo que estamos haciendo en este momento, es que logramos detectar emisión de la línea Bracket Gamma, 
y queremos eh, saber de dónde viene esa misión para poder relacionarlo, si viene directamente desde el JET y es un comportamiento del JET, o si viene desde el disco y ya lo podemos analizar como un escenario más en el disco y no tanto como en el JET. Y eso es todo. Gracias. Eh, es polvo en su mayoría, la verdad, porque pues con eh, Gravity lo que observamos más que todo y es, es casi polvo, eh, es en, en el infrarrojo, pero como tal eh, no sabemos muy bien eh, qué es lo que se está observando. Si es que estamos viendo parte de la, o sea, de, de la influencia en el jet en la cavidad o si como tal es el disco o qué realmente es lo que se está observando porque no se tiene la suficiente resolución para poder saberlo. Entonces, lo que se tiene son especulaciones tanto de que puede ser el disco que está variando y que tiene una morfología completamente complicada o que puede ser la influencia del jet que, que, que está iluminando y que está, digamos, influenciando eh, el escenario de ahí. De... Exacto. Sí, correcto. Any other question? I mean, I'll let you get your permission to extend the break. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, uh, thanks. Okay, gracias. Thank you.